Simon & Schuster Audio presents Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude by Napoleon Hill and W. Clement Stone Read by David White Introduction The greatest secret of success is, there's no secret. That has been discovered by hundreds of thousands of men and women who have read this book in the 25 years since it was first published. The formula for success, far from being secret, inaccessible, or difficult to understand, is clearly spelled out in this audio book. Like those high achievers who preceded you through the ideas herein, you'll find that something wonderful happens to you as a result of your listening. If you are ready, you will achieve physical, mental, and moral health, happiness, wealth, or any other worthwhile goal whose attainment does not violate the laws of God or the rights of your fellow man. Since this edition addresses an entirely new generation of readers, it might be helpful to give some background of the collaboration between the late Dr. Napoleon Hill and me. Think and Grow Rich In 1937, I owned and operated Combined Registry Company, a national sales organization devoted exclusively to accident insurance. Morris Pickus, a well-known sales executive, sales counselor, and lecturer, gave me a book that had just been published titled Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I read it with consuming interest because the philosophy it set forth coincided so closely with my own. In fact, I was so taken by it that I sent copies to every one of my sales representatives throughout the United States. Bingo! I hit the jackpot, for I made a profitable discovery. I found in Think and Grow Rich a working tool that motivated my sales representatives to motivate themselves to increase their sales and profits, and something more, to acquire wealth through responding to its inspirational self-help action message. From then on, Think and Grow Rich was a standard part of the orientation packet given to all new sales representatives in my companies. I met Hill in person for the first time in 1951. He was then 68 years old, and except for occasional speaking engagements, retired to the life of a country gentleman in Glendale, California. We hit it off immediately. Our conversation sparked an array of ideas, and I urged him to come out of retirement and resume his career in motivational training and writing. He said he would on one condition, that I be his general manager. I agreed. Even though as head of a multi-million dollar international insurance corporation, I had more than enough work to keep myself busy. Success Magazine, which began as a digest-sized publication for members of our PMA Science of Success Clubs, was one of the early results of our collaboration. We called it Success Unlimited when we founded it in 1954. Its purpose was to give members a monthly recharge of motivation. We believe that motivation is like a fire. Unless you continue to add fuel, it will go out. The idea worked and our tiny magazine grew slowly but surely over the years, changing to standard size, shortening its name, and adding pages of national advertising, until it developed into the prominent publication it is today. Through all the changes, success has maintained the fundamental ideas that Hill and I put forth in the first issue. These positive concepts are as vital to the success of achievers of the 80s as they were then. They are at the heart of this book. It may seem incredible to listeners who are unfamiliar with the development of self-help literature in this country, but the ideas in this book trace their origins to an interview that Napoleon Hill had in 1908 with the great steelmaker, philosopher, and philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. Hill, who had been born into poverty in the hills of Wise County, Virginia in 1883, was blessed with a calm, patient stepmother who persuaded him not to follow his unruly bent but to gain an education and set high goals for himself. 
He supported himself in college by working as a newspaper and magazine journalist. He hoped to eventually be able to attend law school. That changed, however, one day when he was assigned to interview Carnegie. The great man was so impressed by the young writer that he invited him to his home as a guest. They visited virtually nonstop for three days. The older man romanced the lives of the great philosophers and the impact their ideas had had on civilization through the centuries. It made a great impression on young Hill, who listened with rapt attention. A Challenge Andrew Carnegie knew human nature. One way to motivate an aggressive extrovert with a high energy level who has drive and stick to and whose reason and emotions are in balance is to challenge him. The young guest was such a person, and Carnegie devised an intriguing challenge for him. What is there in the climate of this great nation that I, a foreigner, can build a business and acquire wealth? Carnegie asked. How is it that anyone here can achieve success? And before Hill could answer, he continued, I challenge you to devote 20 years of your life to the study of the philosophy of American achievement and come up with an answer. Will you accept? Yes, exclaimed Hill. Andrew Carnegie had an obsession. Anything in life that is worth having was worth working for. He was willing to give the young author his personal time to consult with him, to give him letters of introduction to the outstanding Americans of the day, and to reimburse him for any necessary out-of-pocket expenses, such as traveling to meet with his interview subjects. But otherwise, Hill was on his own, and he would have to earn his own livelihood while working on the project. In the twenty years that followed, Hill interviewed more than five hundred successful men. Among them were Henry Ford, William Wrigley, Jr., John Wanamaker, George Eastman, John D. Rockefeller, Thomas A. Edison, Theodore Roosevelt, Albert Hubbard, J. Ogden Armour, Luther Burbank, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, and Julius Rosenwald. Hill did earn his own livelihood by applying many of the principles he learned from Carnegie and the men he interviewed. At last, in 1928, he completed his eight-volume work, Law of Success. These books, which were reprinted around the world and are still in print, motivated thousands of people to become outstanding achievers. On the recommendation of Senator Jennings Randolph, Hill became an advisor to two presidents of the United States, Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He influenced decisions that affected the course of American history. While he was working with Roosevelt, seven years after the publication of Law of Success, Hill began writing the manuscript of Think and Grow Rich. It was an immediate bestseller, and it has been in continuous demand ever since. Untold millions of people have read it and recommended it to others just as I did. Think and Grow Rich builds on the basic principles of Andrew Carnegie's philosophy, as spelled out by Hill in Law of Success. What Hill and I undertook to do in this book, and I believe we accomplished it, was to distill the essence of both into a context that would make them immediately accessible. And something more. Success through a positive mental attitude tells you specifically how to use the most magnificent machine ever conceived, a machine so awesome that only God himself could create it. This machine is your brain and nervous system, a human computer, from which the electronic computer was designed as to function, but which it can never equal. Success through a positive mental attitude instructs you on exactly what to do and how to do it in order to tap the powers of your subconscious mind and put them to work for you. Think for a moment. Have you ever been taught how to constructively use neutralize, control, or harmonize with your passions, emotions, instincts, tendencies, feelings, moods, and habits of thought and action? Have you ever been taught exactly how to aim high and achieve your goals regardless of the obstacles? If your answer is no, congratulations, for you are on the verge of self-discovery. You will be taught these things if you listen to and apply the principles in this book. Results are what count. Every inspirational self-help action book should be judged by one immutable test. Results. 
That is, by whether or not it motivated the listener to motivate himself to desirable action. By this standard, success through a positive mental attitude is reputed to be one of the most successful books of its type ever published. Napoleon Hill, who died in 1970, counted it among his greatest accomplishments. In the 25 years since it first appeared in bookstores, more than 900,000 copies have been printed. Our readers have had phenomenal results in changing their lives for the better, in meeting daily problems courageously, and bringing their desires into reality. Og Mandino, renowned motivational speaker and author of The Greatest Salesman in the World and a string of other best-selling books, was one of those who experienced great changes in his life as a result of reading Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale wrote to me when I told him about this new publication, saying, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude is one of the few creative motivational books of our time. It should be on the required list of anyone who desires success. Another outstanding motivator, Dennis Waitley, author of Seeds of Greatness and Psychology of Winning, told me, Your all-time classic changed my life, from that of an also-ran to a front-runner. Napoleon Hill gave me the start, and you are a constant source of inspiration to me today. I tell people, if you want to be an enduring winner, read Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude once a year. I do, and I learn something new from it each time. Reverend Robert H. Schuler told me, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude is one of the ten books that has most impacted my faith and my philosophy. It is a premier book, a classic book, a historic book on one of the most important subjects a person can study. No person's education is complete without the concepts you and Napoleon Hill articulated in it so wisely and so well. But perhaps the most gratifying evidence of the book's results over the years has been the many individuals who have approached me after speaking engagements and asked me to autograph their copies. Almost invariably, they tell me, I want to thank you for changing my life with this book. While I could give thousands of such testimonials, the greatest one would be yours when you learn and apply the principles in this book. Special Instructions Listen to this book as though we, the authors, were your personal friends and were speaking to you and you alone. Make note of sentences, quotations, and words that are meaningful to you. Memorize self-motivators. Keep in mind at all times that the purpose of this book is to motivate you to desirable action. Abraham Lincoln developed the habit of trying to learn from the books he read, the people he met, and from casual events in daily life. These gave him ideas for reflection, and through it, he was able to recognize, relate, assimilate, and use ideas as his own. You, too, can convert your creative thinking, artistic talent, knowledge, personality, and physical energy into success, wealth, and happiness. This book tells you how, and if you will let it, it will motivate you to try. Look for the message in it that is applicable to you. When you recognize it, pay attention. Get into action. To direct your mind into desired channels, trying to answer each question at the end of every chapter during your thinking and planning time. To borrow a phrase from Pat Ryan, President and CEO of Combined International, the insurance company I founded, it's impossible for you to conceive how far up is, except for the limitations of your own mind. W. Clement Stone Part 1. Where the Road to Achievement Begins Chapter 1. Meet the Most Important Living Person Meet the most important living person. Somewhere in this book you will meet him, suddenly, surprisingly, and with a shock of recognition that will change your whole life. When you do meet him, you will discover his secret. You will discover that he carries with him an invisible talisman with the initials PMA emblazoned on one side and NMA on the other. This invisible talisman has two amazing powers. It has the power to attract wealth, success, happiness, and health. And it has the power to repel these things, 
to rob you of all that makes life worth living. It is the first of these powers, PMA, that enables some men to climb to the top and stay there. It is the second that keeps other men at the bottom all their lives. It is NMA that pulls other men down from the top when they have reached it. Perhaps the story of S.B. Fuller will illustrate how it works. We are poor, not because of God. S.B. Fuller was one of seven children of a Negro tenant farmer in Louisiana. He started to work at the age of five. By the time he was nine, he was driving mules. There was nothing unusual in this. The children of most of the tenant farmers went to work early. These families accepted poverty as their lot and asked for no better. Young Fuller was different from his friends in one way. He had a remarkable mother. His mother refused to accept this hand-to-mouth existence for her children, though it was all she had ever known. She knew there was something wrong with the fact that her family was barely getting along in a world of joy and plenty. She used to talk to her son about her dreams. We shouldn't be poor, S.B., she used to say. And don't ever let me hear you say that it is God's will that we are poor. We are poor, not because of God. We are poor because Father has never developed a desire to become rich. No one in our family has ever developed a desire to be anything else. No one had developed a desire to be wealthy. This idea became so deeply ingrained in Fuller's mind that it changed his whole life. He began to want to be rich. He kept his mind on the things he did want and off the things he didn't want. Thus he developed a burning desire to become rich. The quickest way to make money, he decided, was to sell something. He chose soap. For twelve years he sold it door to door. Then he learned that the company which supplied him was going to be sold at auction. The firm price was $150,000. In twelve years of selling and setting aside every penny, he had saved $25,000. It was agreed that he would deposit his $25,000 and obtain the balance of $125,000 within a ten-day period. Written into the contract was the condition that if he did not raise the money, he would lose his deposit. During his twelve years as a soap salesman, S.B. Fuller had gained the respect and admiration of many businessmen. He went to them now. He obtained money from personal friends, too, and from loan companies and investment groups. On the eve of the tenth day, he had raised $115,000. He was $10,000 short. Search for the Light I had exhausted every source of credit I knew, he recalls. It was late at night. In the darkness of my room, I knelt down and prayed. I asked God to lead me to a person who would let me have the $10,000 in time. I said to myself that I would drive down 61st Street until I saw the first light in a business establishment. I asked God to make the light a sign indicating His answer. It was 11 o'clock at night when S.B. Fuller drove down Chicago's 61st Street. At last, after several blocks, he saw a light in a contractor's office. He walked in. There, seated at his desk, tired from working late at night, sat a man whom Fuller knew slightly. Fuller realized that he would have to be bold. Do you want to make one thousand dollars? asked Fuller straight out. The contractor was taken aback at the question. Yes, he said, of course. Then make out a check for ten thousand dollars, and when I bring back the money, I'll bring back another one thousand dollar profit, Fuller recalls telling this man. He gave the contractor the names of the other people who had lent him money, and explained in detail exactly what the business venture was. Let's explore his secret of success. Before he left that night, S.B. Fuller had a check for $10,000 in his pocket. Subsequently, he obtained controlling interest not only in that company, but in seven others, including four cosmetic companies, a hosiery company, a label company, and a newspaper. When we asked him recently to explore with us the secret of his success, he answered in terms of his mother's statement so many years before. We are poor, not because of God. We are poor because Father has never developed a desire to become rich. No one in our family has ever developed a desire to be anything else.
You see, he told us, I knew what I wanted, but I didn't know how to get it. So I read the Bible and inspirational books for a purpose. I prayed for the knowledge to achieve my objectives. Three books played an important part in transmuting my burning desire into reality. They were, one, the Bible, two, think and grow rich, and three, the secret of the ages. My greatest inspiration comes from reading the Bible. If you know what you want, you are more apt to recognize it when you see it. When you read a book, for example, you will recognize opportunities to help you get what you want. S.B. Fuller carried with him the invisible talisman with the initials PMA imprinted on one side and NMA on the other. He turned the PMA side up and amazing things happened. He was able to bring into reality ideas that were formerly mere daydreams. Now the important thing to notice here is that S.B. Fuller started life with fewer advantages than most of us have, but he chose a big goal and headed for it. Of course, the choice of goal was individual. In these times and in this country, you still have your personal right to say, this is what I choose. This is what I want most to accomplish. And unless your goal is against the laws of God or society, you can achieve it. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose by trying. Success is achieved and maintained by those who keep trying with PMA. What you try for is up to you. Not everyone would care to be an S.B. Fuller, responsible for large manufacturing concerns. Not everyone would choose to pay the costly price of being a great artist. To many, the riches of life are quite different. A skill in day-to-day -day living which adds up to a happy, love-filled life is success. You can have this and other riches too. The choice is yours. But whether success to you means becoming rich as it did to S.B. Fuller, or the discovery of a new element in chemistry, or the creation of a piece of music, or the growing of a rose, or the nurturing of a child, no matter what success means to you, the invisible talisman with the initials PMA emblazoned on one side and NMA on the other can help you achieve it. You attract the good and desirable with PMA. You repel them with NMA. Every adversity has the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. But what if I have a physical handicap? How can a change of attitude help me, you may ask? Perhaps the story of Tom Dempsey, a boy who was disabled at birth, will give you your answer. Tom was born without half a right foot and only a stub of a right arm. As a boy, he wanted to engage in sports as the other boys did. He had a burning desire to play football. Because of this desire, his parents had an artificial foot made for him. It was made of wood. The wooden foot was encased in a special stubby football shoe. Hour after hour, day after day, Tom would practice kicking the football with his wooden foot. He would try and keep on trying to make field goals at greater and greater distances. He became so proficient that he was hired by the New Orleans Saints. The screams of 66,910 football fans could be heard throughout the entire United States when, within the last two seconds of the game, Tom Dempsey, with his crippled leg, kicked a record-breaking 63-yard field goal. It was the longest field goal ever kicked in a professional football game. It gave the Saints a winning score of 1917 over the Detroit Lions. We were beaten by a miracle, said Detroit coach Joseph Schmidt. And to many, it was a miracle, an answer to a prayer. Tom Dempsey didn't kick that field goal. God kicked it, said Lion linebacker Wayne Walker. Interesting, but what does the Tom Dempsey story mean to me, you may ask? Our response would be, very little, unless you develop the habit of recognizing, relating, assimilating, and using universal principles and adopt them as your very own then follow through with desirable action. And what are the principles you could apply from the Tom Dempsey story, whether or not you are physically disabled? They can be learned and applied by children and adults. Greatness comes to those who develop a burning desire to achieve high goals. 
Success is achieved and maintained by those who try and keep on trying with PMA. To become an expert achiever in any human activity, it takes practice, practice, practice. Effort and work can become fun when you establish specific desirable goals. With every adversity, there is a seed of an equivalent or greater benefit for those who are motivated with PMA to become achievers. Man's greatest power lies in the power of prayer. To learn and apply these principles, turn up your invisible talisman to the PMA side. When Henley wrote the poetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. He could have informed us that we are the masters of our fate because we are masters first of our attitudes. Our attitudes shape our future. This is a universal law. The poet could have told us with great emphasis that this law works whether the attitudes are destructive or constructive. The law states that we translate into physical reality the thoughts and attitudes which we hold in our minds, no matter what they are. We translate into reality thoughts of poverty just as quickly as we do thoughts of riches. But when our attitude toward ourselves is big, and our attitude toward others is generous and merciful, we attract big and generous portions of success. A Truly Great Man Consider the example of Henry J. Kaiser, a truly successful person because his attitude toward himself is big. Companies identified with the name Henry J. Kaiser hold assets of more than one billion dollars. Because he is generous and merciful to others, the speechless have been made to talk, the crippled have been restored to useful lives, and hundreds of thousands of persons have received hospital care at a very low cost. All this grew from seeds of thought planted within him by his mother. Mary Kaiser gave her son Henry the priceless gift. She also taught him to apply the greatest value in life. 1. The Priceless Gift After her day's work, Mary Kaiser would spend hours as a volunteer nurse helping the unfortunate. Often she said to her son, Henry, nothing is ever accomplished without work. If I leave you nothing else but the will to work, I will have left you the priceless gift, the joy of work. 2. The greatest value in life. It was my mother, said Mr. Kaiser, who first taught me some of the greatest values in life. Among these were the love of people and the importance of serving others. Loving people and serving them, she used to say, is the greatest value in life. Henry J. Kaiser knows the power of PMA. He knows what it can do in his life and for his country. He also knows the force of NMA. During World War II, he built over 1,500 ships with such rapidity that he startled the world. When he said, we can construct a Liberty ship every 10 days, the experts said, it can't be done, it's impossible, yet Kaiser did it. Those who believe they can't repel the positive. They use the negative side of their talisman. Those who believe they can repel the negative. They use the positive side. That is why we must be cautious when we use this talisman. Its PMA side can get for you all the rich blessings of life. It can help you to overcome your difficulties and to discover your strengths. It can help you step out ahead of your competitors. And, as with Kaiser, it can turn what others say is impossible into reality. But the NMA side is just as powerful. Instead of attracting happiness and success, it can attract despair and defeat. Like all power, the talisman is dangerous if we don't use it properly. How the Force of NMA Repels There's a very interesting story which illustrates how the force of NMA repels. It comes out of one of the southern states. There, where wood-burning fireplaces are still used to heat homes, lived a woodcutter who also was an unsuccessful person. For more than two years, he had supplied a certain homeowner with firewood. The woodcutter knew that the logs could not be larger than seven inches in diameter if they were to fit this particular fireplace. 
On one occasion, this old customer ordered a cord of wood, but was away when it was delivered. On arriving home, he discovered that most of the wood was larger than the specified size. He called the woodcutter and asked him to have the oversized logs exchanged or split. I can't do that, said the wood dealer. It would cost more than the whole load is worth. With that, he hung up. So the homeowner was left with the job of splitting the logs himself. He rolled up his sleeves and set to work. About halfway through the job, he noticed that one particular log had a very large knot hole which someone had plugged up. The homeowner lifted the log. It seemed unusually light and appeared to be hollow. With a hefty swing of the axe, he split the log. A blackened roll of tin foil fell out. The homeowner stooped down, picked up the roll, and unwrapped it. To his amazement, it contained very old fifty and one hundred dollar bills. Slowly he counted them. They amounted to exactly two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. The bills had evidently been in the tree for many years, as the paper was very brittle. The homeowner had PMA. His only thought was to get the money back to its rightful owner. He picked up the telephone, called the wood dealer again, and asked him where he had cut this load. Again, the woodcutter's NMA asserted its repelling power. That's nobody's business but mine, he said. If you give away your secrets, people will cheat you every time. Despite many efforts, the homeowner never learned where the logs came from or who had sealed the money inside. Now, the point of this story does not lie in irony. It is true that the man with PMA found the money, while the man with NMA had not. But it is also true that good breaks do occur in everyone's life. However, the man who lives with NMA will prevent life's lucky breaks from benefiting him. And the man with PMA will so arrange his attitudes that he will turn even the bad breaks into advantages. On the sales staff of the Combined Insurance Company of America, there was a salesman named Al Allen. Al wanted to be the company's star salesman. He tried to apply the PMA principles found in the inspirational books and magazines he read. He read an editorial in Success Unlimited magazine entitled Develop Inspirational Dissatisfaction. It wasn't long after that he had an opportunity to put into practice what he had read. He had a bad break. This gave him the opportunity to arrange his attitudes so that he could use the PMA side of his talisman effectively. He developed inspirational dissatisfaction. One icy winter day, Al cold canvassed every store in a city block in Wisconsin. He walked in unannounced and tried to sell insurance. On that day, Al did not make a single sale. Of course he was dissatisfied. But Al's PMA turned this dissatisfaction into inspirational dissatisfaction. Why? He remembered the editorial he had read. He applied the principle. The next day, before setting out from the local office, he told his fellow salesman about his failures the day before. He said, Wait and see. Today I'm going back to call on those same prospects, and I'll sell more insurance than all the rest of you combined. And the remarkable thing is that Al did it. He went back to that same city block and again called on every person he had talked to the day before. He sold 66 new accident contracts. Now this was an unusual achievement, and it happened because of the bad breaks when Al trudged through the sleet and wind for eight hours without selling a single policy. Al Allen was able to rearrange his attitudes. He was able to convert the negative kind of dissatisfaction that most of us would feel in similar circumstances of failure on one day, into inspirational dissatisfaction which resulted in success the next day. Al did become the company's best salesman and was promoted to a sales manager. This ability to turn the invisible talisman over and use the side which has the force of PMA rather than the side which has the force of NMA is characteristic of so many of our really successful people. Most of us are inclined to look upon success as coming in some mysterious way through advantages that we do not have. Perhaps because we do have them, we don't see them. The obvious is often unseen. Every man's PMA is his advantage, 
and there is nothing mysterious about it. Henry Ford, after he had achieved success, was the subject of much envy. People felt that because of good fortune or influential friends or genius or whatever they thought was Ford's secret, because of these things, Ford was successful. And no doubt some of these elements played a part, but there was something more. Perhaps one person in every hundred thousand knew the real reason for Ford's success, and those few were usually ashamed to speak of it because of its simplicity. A single glimpse of Ford in action will illustrate the secret perfectly. Years ago, Henry Ford decided to develop the now famous motor known as V8. He wanted to build an engine with the entire eight cylinders cast in one block. He instructed his engineers to produce a design for such an engine. To a man, the engineers agreed that it was simply impossible to cast an eight-cylinder gasoline engine block in one piece. Ford said, produce it anyway. But they replied, it's impossible. Go to work, Ford commanded, and stay on the job until you succeed no matter how much time is required. The engineers went to work. There was nothing else for them to do if they were to remain on the Ford staff. Six months went by, and they had not succeeded. Another six months passed, and still no success. The more the engineers tried, the more the thing seemed impossible. At the end of the year, Ford checked with his engineers. Once again, they informed him that they had found no way to carry out his orders. Keep working, said Ford. I want it, and I'll have it. And what happened? Well, of course, the engine wasn't impossible at all. The Ford V8 became the most spectacularly successful car on the road, pulling Henry Ford and his company so far out in front of his nearest competitor that it took years for them to catch up. He was using PMA, and the same power is available to you. If you use it, if you turn your talisman to the right side as Henry Ford did, you too can achieve success in bringing into reality the possibility of the improbable. If you know what you want, you can find a way to get it. A man of 25 has before him some 100,000 working hours should he retire at 65. How many of your working hours will be alive with the magnificent force of PMA? And how many of them will have the life knocked out of them with the stunning blows of NMA? But how do you go about putting PMA to work in your life rather than NMA? Some people seem to use this power instinctively. When it came to developing the Ford car, Henry Ford was one of these. Others have to learn. Al Allen learned by relating and assimilating what he read in inspirational magazines and books. Success through a positive mental attitude is such a book. You too can learn to develop PMA. Some people use PMA for a while, but when they receive a setback, they lose faith in it. They start out right, but some bad breaks cause them to flip the talisman wrong side up. They fail to realize that success is maintained by those who keep trying with PMA. They are like the famous old racehorse John P. Greer. John P. Greer was a thoroughbred of great promise. Such promise, in fact, that he was groomed, trained, and billed as the only horse that stood a chance of beating the greatest racehorse of all time, Man o' War. Don't let your mental attitude make you a has-been. In the Dwyer Stakes at Aqueduct in July of 1920, the two horses finally met. It was a magnificent day. All eyes were riveted on the starting post. The two horses got away evenly. Down the track they went side by side. It was clear that John P. Greer was giving Man o' War the race of his life. At the quarter mark, they were even. The half mark. The three-quarter mark, and still they were even. At the eighth pole, neck and neck. Then in the stretch, John P. Greer brought the crowd to its feet. Slowly, he edged ahead. It was a moment of crisis for Man o' War's jockey. He made up his mind. For the first time in the great horse's career, the jockey flicked him solidly on the rump with his whip. Man o' War reacted as though the jockey had set fire to his tail. He shot out ahead and pulled away from John P. Greer as if the other horse were standing still. At the end of the race, 
Man o' War was seven lengths ahead. But the significant thing from our point of view was the effect of defeat on the other horse. John P. Greer had been a horse of great spirit. Victory was in his attitude. But he was so broken by this experience that he never really recovered. All of his races afterwards were weak, half-hearted attempts, and he never won again. People are not racehorses. But this story is reminiscent of far too many men who in the boom years of the 1920s started off with a wonderful attitude of success. They achieved financial success and then, when the Depression struck in 1930, they experienced defeat. They were crushed. Their attitude changed from positive to negative. Their talisman flipped to the side that read NMA. They stopped trying. They, like John P. Greer, became has-beens. Some people seem to use PMA pretty much all the time. Others start and then quit. But others, the vast majority of us, have never really begun to use the tremendous powers available to us. What about us? Can we learn to use PMA as we've learned other skills? The answer, based on our years of experience, is a definite yes. This is the subject of this book. In the chapters that follow, we will show you how it can be done. The effort to learn will be worth it because PMA is the essential ingredient in all success. Meet the most important living person. The day you recognize PMA for yourself is the day that you will meet the most important living person. Who is he? Why, the most important living person is you, as far as you and your life are concerned. Take a look at yourself. Isn't it true that you carry with you an invisible talisman with the initials PMA emblazoned on one side and NMA on the other? What exactly is this talisman, this force? The talisman is your mind. PMA is a positive mental attitude. A positive mental attitude is the right mental attitude. What is the right mental attitude? It is most often comprised of the plus characteristics symbolized by such words as faith, integrity, hope, optimism, courage, initiative, generosity, tolerance, tact, kindliness, and good common sense. A person with positive mental attitude aims for high goals and constantly strives to achieve them. NMA is a negative mental attitude. It has opposite characteristics to PMA. After years spent studying successful men, the authors of Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude have come to the conclusion that a positive mental attitude is the one simple secret shared by them all. It was PMA that helped S.B. Fuller overcome the disadvantages of poverty. It was PMA that motivated Tom Dempsey, despite his crippled leg, to kick the longest field goal ever kicked in a professional football game. And it was certainly a positive mental attitude that enabled Henry J. Kaiser to build a Liberty ship every ten days. It was Al Allen's ability to turn his talisman right side up that motivated him to return to his prospects, the very ones who had refused him the day before and set a new sales record. Do you know how to make your invisible talisman work for you? Perhaps you do. Perhaps you don't. Perhaps you have developed and strengthened your PMA until life is bringing you every worthwhile wish. But if you haven't, you can and will learn the techniques whereby you can release your power of PMA through its magic in your life as you continue to listen to this book. A positive mental attitude, what it is and how it may be developed and applied, is described throughout this book. It is the one essential principle of this book's 17 principles for achieving worthwhile success. Achievement is attained through some combination of PMA with one or more of the other 16 success principles. Master them. Begin applying each of them as you recognize them while listening to success through a positive mental attitude. When you make each principle a part of your life, yours will be a positive mental attitude in its most powerful form. And the payoff will be success, health, happiness, wealth, or whatever definite aims you may have in life. 
These will be yours, provided you don't violate the laws of infinite intelligence and the rights of your fellow men. Such violations are the most repellent forms of NMA. In Chapter 2, you will find the formula by which you may keep your mind positive. Master that formula. Apply it in all that you do, and you will be on your way to the attainment of your every desire. Pilot Number 1. Thoughts to Steer By 1. Meet the most important living person. That person is you. Your success, health, happiness, wealth depend on how you use your invisible talisman. How will you use it? The choice is yours. 2. Your mind is your invisible talisman. The letters PMA, positive mental attitude, are emblazoned on one side, and NMA, negative mental attitude, on the other. These are powerful forces. PMA is the right mental attitude for each specific occasion. It has the power to attract the good and the beautiful. NMA repels them. It is a negative mental attitude that robs you of all that makes life worth living. Self-question. How can I develop the right mental attitude? Be specific. 3. Don't blame God for your lack of success. Like S.B. Fuller, you can develop a burning desire to succeed. How? Keep your mind on the things you want and off the things you don't want. How? 4. Like S.B. Fuller, read the Bible and inspirational books for a purpose. Ask for divine guidance. Search for the light. Self-question. Do you believe it's proper to ask for divine guidance? 5. Every adversity has the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit for those who have PMA. Sometimes the things that seem to be adversities turn out to be opportunities in disguise. Tom Dempsey discovered this as a cripple. Self-question. Will you engage in thinking time to determine how you can turn adversities into seeds of equivalent or greater benefits? 6. Accept the priceless gift, the joy of work. Apply the greatest value in life, love people, and serve them. Like Henry J. Kaiser, you will attract big and generous portions of success. You can if you develop PMA. Self-question. Will you search to find out how you can develop PMA as you continue to listen to this book? 7. Never underestimate the repellent power of a negative mental attitude. It can prevent life's lucky breaks from benefiting you. Self-question. PMA attracts good luck. How can I develop the habit of PMA? 8. You can profit by disappointment if it is turned into inspirational dissatisfaction with PMA. Like Al Allen, develop inspirational dissatisfaction. Rearrange your attitudes and convert a failure of one day into success on another. How do you think you can develop inspirational dissatisfaction? 9. Bring into reality the possibility of the improbable by acquiring PMA. Say to yourself, as Henry Ford said to his engineers, keep working. Self-question. Have you the courage to aim high and strive daily to keep your goal before you? 10. Don't let your mental attitude make you a has-been. When you become successful and a depression or any other unfavorable circumstance arises which causes you a loss or defeat, act on the self-motivator. Success is achieved by those who try and maintained by those who keep trying with PMA. This is the way to avoid being crushed. Universal Principles in Self-Motivator Form Every adversity has the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. Greatness comes to those who develop a burning desire to achieve high goals. Success is achieved and maintained by those who try and keep on trying with PMA. To become an expert achiever in any human activity, it takes practice, practice, practice.
Man's greatest power lies in the power of prayer. Chapter 2 You Can Change Your World We now know that PMA is a positive mental attitude, and we also know that a positive mental attitude is one of the 17 success principles. When you begin to apply a combination of these principles with PMA in your chosen occupation or to a solution of your personal problems, you are on the road to success. Then you are on the right track and headed in the right direction toward getting what you want. To achieve anything worthwhile in life, it is imperative that you apply PMA, regardless of what other success principles you employ. PMA is the catalyst which makes any combination of success principles work to attain a worthwhile end. It is NMA, combined with some of the same principles, that is the catalyst which results in crime or evil. And grief, disaster, tragedy, sin, disease, death are some of its rewards. 17 Success Principles The authors have for many years given lectures, instructed classes, and conducted a correspondence course on the 17 Success Principles. The title of the course, PMA, The Science of Success. These 17 principles are 1. A positive mental attitude. 2. Definiteness of purpose. 3. Going the extra mile. 4. Accurate thinking. 5. Self-discipline. 6. The master mind. 7. Applied faith. 8. A pleasing personality. 9. Personal initiative. 10. Enthusiasm. 11. Controlled attention. 12. Teamwork. 13. Learning from defeat. 14. Creative vision. 15. Budgeting time and money. 16. Maintaining sound physical and mental health. 17. Using cosmic habit force. Universal law. These 17 success principles are no creation of the authors. They were extracted from the lifetime experiences of hundreds of the most successful persons our nation has known during the past century. As long as you live, from this day forward, you can analyze your every success and every failure. That is, if you imprint these 17 principles indelibly in your memory. You may develop and maintain a permanent positive mental attitude by making it your responsibility to adopt and apply these 17 principles in your daily living. There is no other known method by which you may keep your mind positive. Analyze yourself courageously now and learn which of these 17 principles you have been using and which of them you have been neglecting. In the future, analyze both your successes and your failures using the 17 principles as a measuring device. And very soon, you will be able to lay your finger on what has been holding you back. If you have PMA and don't succeed, then what? If you use PMA and don't succeed, it may be because you are not using each of the principles that are necessary in the combination for success to attain your specific goal. You may wish to check the stories of S.B. Fuller, Tom Dempsey, Henry J. Kaiser, The Woodcutter, Al Allen, and Henry Ford to recognize which of the 17 success principles each person applied or neglected to apply. You might analyze someone you know who is a has-been in real life. As you read the case histories and the chapters which follow, do the same thing. Ask yourself, which of the 17 success principles are used? Which are omitted? At first, it may be difficult to understand and apply the principles. But as you continue to listen to success through a positive mental attitude, each of these principles will become more clear to you. You will then be able to use them. When you get to Chapter 20, you will be able to check yourself accurately by the 17 success principles. There you will find a self-analysis chart under the heading Success Quotient Analysis. Has the world given you a raw deal? The students who have enrolled in the PMA Science of Success course 
have often been people who considered themselves failures in some area of their lives. The very first question such a person might be asked when he enters this class is, Why? Why are you taking this course? Why haven't you had the success you would like to have? And the reasons which they give tell us a tragic story about the causes of failure. I never really had a chance to get ahead. My father was an alcoholic, you know. I was raised in the slums, and that's something you can never get out of your system. I only had a grammar school education. These people are all saying, in essence, that the world has given them a raw deal. They are blaming the world and circumstances outside themselves for their failures. They blame their heredity or their environment. They start out with a negative mental attitude. And of course, with that attitude, they are handicapped. But it is NMA that is holding them down, not the external handicap which they give as the cause of their failure. A Lesson Learned from a Child There's a wonderful little story about a minister who one Saturday morning was trying to prepare his sermon under difficult conditions. His wife was out shopping. It was a rainy day, and his young son was restless and bored with nothing to do. Finally, in desperation, the minister picked up an old magazine and thumbed through it until he came to a large, brightly colored picture. It showed a map of the world. He tore the page from the magazine, ripped it into little bits, and threw the scraps all over the living room floor with the words, Johnny, if you can put this all together, I'll give you a quarter. The preacher thought this would take Johnny most of the morning, but within ten minutes there was a knock on his study door. It was his son with the completed puzzle. The minister was amazed to see Johnny finish so soon, with the pieces of paper neatly arranged and the map of the world back in order. Son, how did you get that done so fast? the preacher asked. Oh, said Johnny, it was easy. On the other side there was a picture of a man. I just put a piece of paper on the bottom, put the picture of the man together, put a piece of paper on top, and then turned it over. I figured that if I got the man right, the world would be right. The minister smiled and handed his son a quarter. And you've given me my sermon for tomorrow, too, he said. If a man is right, his world will be right. There's a great lesson in this idea. If you are unhappy with your world and want to change it, the place to start is with yourself. If you are right, your world will be right. This is what PMA is all about. When you have a positive mental attitude, the problems of your world tend to bow before you. You were born a champion. Have you ever thought about the battles you won before you were born? Stop and think about yourself, says Amram Scheinfeld, an expert on genetics. In all the history of the world, there was never anyone else exactly like you. And in all the infinity of time to come, there will never be another. You are a very special person. And many struggles took place that had to be successfully concluded in order to produce you. Just think. Tens of millions of sperm cells participated in a great battle, yet only one of them won, the one that made you. It was a great race to reach a single object, a precious egg containing a tiny nucleus. This goal for which the sperms were competing was smaller in size than the point of a needle, and each sperm was so small that it would have to be magnified thousands of times before it could be seen by the human eye. Yet it is on this microscopic level that your life's most decisive battle was fought. The head of each of the millions of sperms contained a precious cargo of 24 chromosomes, just as there were 24 in the tiny nucleus of the egg. Each chromosome was composed of jelly-like beads closely strung together. Each bead contained hundreds of genes to which scientists attribute all the factors of your heredity. The chromosomes in the sperm comprised all the hereditary material and tendencies contributed by your father and his ancestors. Those in the egg nucleus, the inheritable traits of your mother and her ancestors. Your mother and father themselves represented the culmination of over two billion years of victory in the battle to survive. And then one particular sperm, the fastest, 
the healthiest, the winner, united with the waiting egg to form one tiny living cell. The life of the most important living person had begun. You had become a champion over the most staggering odds you will ever have to face. For all practical purposes, you had inherited from the vast reservoir of the past all the potential abilities and powers you need to achieve your objectives. You were born to be a champion, and no matter what obstacles and difficulties lie in your way, they are not one-tenth so great as the ones that have already been overcome at the moment of your conception. Victory is built in to every living person. Take the case of Irving Ben Cooper, who was one of America's most respected judges. But this was very far from the way young Ben Cooper thought of himself as a young boy. How a Frightened Boy Developed PMA Ben grew up in a near-slum neighborhood in St. Joseph, Missouri. His father was an immigrant tailor who earned little money. Many days there simply wasn't enough to eat. To heat their small home, Ben used to take a coal scuttle and walk down to the railroad tracks that ran nearby. There he would pick up pieces of coal. It embarrassed Ben to have to do it. He'd often try to sneak through the back street so children from school wouldn't see him. But they often did. There was one gang of boys in particular who found great sport in ambushing Ben on his way home from the tracks and beating him up. They would scatter his coal all over the street and send him home with tears streaming from his eyes. Thus it was that Ben lived in a more or less permanent state of fear and self-despising. Something happened, as it always must when we break the pattern of defeat. The victory within us does not assert itself until we are ready. Ben was inspired to positive action because he read a book. It was Robert Coverdale's Struggle by Horatio Alger. In it, Ben read the adventures of a youngster like himself who was faced with great odds, but who overcame these odds with the courage and moral strength which Ben wished to possess. The boy read every one of the Horatio Alger books he could borrow. As he read, he lived the part of the hero. All winter, he sat in the cold kitchen reading stories of courage and success, unconsciously absorbing a positive mental attitude. Some months after he read his first Horatio Alger book, Ben Cooper was again making a trip down to the railroad tracks. Off in the distance, he saw three figures dart behind a building. His first thought was to turn and run. Then he remembered the courage that he had admired in his book heroes, and instead of turning, his hand gripped the coal scuffle more tightly, and he marched straight ahead, as if he were one of the Alger heroes. It was a brutal fight. The three boys jumped Ben all at the same time. His bucket dropped, and he started flailing his arms with a determination that caught the bullies by surprise. Ben's right hand smashed into the lips and nose of one of the boys, his left hand into his stomach. To Ben's surprise, the boy stopped fighting and turned and ran. Meanwhile, the other two boys were hitting and kicking him. Ben managed to push one boy away and knock the other down. He jumped on the second boy with his knees, while he plowed punch after punch into his stomach and jaw as if he were mad. Now there was just one boy left. This was the leader. He had jumped on top of Ben. Ben managed to pull him aside and get on his feet. For a second, the two boys stood and looked each other squarely in the eyes. And then, bit by bit, the leader stepped backwards. He, too, ran away. Perhaps it was righteous indignation but Ben picked up a chunk of coal and threw it at the retreater. It wasn't until then that Ben realized that his nose was bleeding and that he had black and blue marks on his body from the punches and kicks he had received. It was worth it. It was a great day in Ben's life. In that moment, he overcame fear. Ben Cooper wasn't much stronger than he had been a year earlier. His attackers were no less tough. The difference came in Ben's own mental attitude. He had faced danger in spite of fear. He decided that no longer was he going to be pushed around by bullies. From now on, he himself was going to change his world. And of course, this is exactly what he did. Identify yourself with a successful image. The boy gave himself an identity. 
When he fought the three bullies on the street that day, he was not fighting as frightened, undernourished Ben Cooper. He was fighting as Robert Coverdale, or any other of the plucky and daring heroes of Horatio Alger's books. Identifying oneself with a successful image can help break the habits of self-doubt and defeat which years of NMA set up within a personality. Another and equally important successful technique for changing your world is to identify yourself with an image that will inspire you to make the right decisions. It can be a slogan, a picture, or any other symbol that is meaningful to you. What will your picture say to you? The president of a Midwest concern operating internationally was visiting his San Francisco office. He noticed a large photograph of himself on the wall of the office of Dorothy Jones, a private secretary. Dottie, that's a rather large picture for this size room, isn't it? He asked. Dorothy responded, when I have a problem, do you know what I do? Without waiting for an answer, she demonstrated by placing her elbows on her desk, propping her head on the fingers of her folded hands, and looking up at the picture. Boss, how the heck would you solve this problem, she asked. Dottie's remarks seem rather humorous, yet the essence of her idea is startling. Perhaps you have a picture in your office, your home, or in your wallet that could give you the right answer to an important question in your life. Yours may be a picture of your mother, father, wife, husband, of Benjamin Franklin or Abraham Lincoln. It may be that of a saint. What will your picture say to you? There is one way to find out. When you are faced with a serious problem or decision, ask your picture a question. Listen for the answer. Another essential ingredient for changing your world is to have definiteness of purpose, one of the 17 principles of success.